So it's very good for you to try and get in a process of how to answer those. And then also as well, we're going to cover support for the process. I'm going to finish off with a QA. and a um, So this is quite an interactive presentation. So I will be asking you questions. So if you can just put them into the chat box, uh, we'll be, they'll be getting moderated. So then we'll be able to add them and pass them through over to myself as well. So this is just a little video about FDM group. So I'll just go into this here. Let me know if you can hear the note uh, as well. So yes, that was just a little video, um, just a bit about us, just for a little introduction there. So I'm um, going to actually cover what does FDM do. So this is kind of the business program. This is how it's built. So it's really three steps. We recruit, we train and we deploy. So this is kind of the pathway we should be expected to go through. Um, so we, we actually recruit three different areas of people. So graduates such as yourselves. And we also do X forces and we also do returners to work. So it is very niche avenues, but it definitely helps people uh, transition into the technical areas as well. So what we actually train in is software development, software testing, technical operations, business intelligence and robotic process automation. So there are actually a few more, but I'll go into more detail about those individual pathways um, a bit further on in the presentation. Um, so once you've trained, uh, once we've trained you up, that's when you move on to being deployed with our clients. Um, so we have clients all around the UK. Um, so the short to long term deployments You'll be doing it for over a two year period, uh, but those individual placements can range from six months within that time as well. Uh, but our graduate programme doesn't just end after the uh, at the two years. You also have um, abilities to transfer to the client. You also have the ability to stay with the FDM where you become a senior consultant, uh, but also you can just use all the skills and experiences that you've gained to seek opportunities elsewhere. So that's kind of the business model that we do go by. Um, what I'll do next is I'll just move on to the actual structure of the onboarding process. Uh, so this is where you'd be expected to go through. So the technical roles. So like I mentioned, these are the five main technical avenues that we have with our graduate program. So I'll just start off with technical operations. So with this one, I always put it forward as this is an opportunity where you can still be in a technical capacity, but you also get the opportunity to get your hands dirty. So um, you're going to be looking at the infrastructure or the networks of the business and just ensuring that they work to the best of their ability. So it might be uh, coding or software, seeing whether those kind of processes work. It can also be hardware, like I mentioned, with networks as well. So you get to actually use, actually look to and see the processes behind the business and make sure that they're keeping it a well, well oiled machine as well. So just moving on to business intelligence data analysts, um, as you can probably see from the title, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's about data analytics. Um, so uh, with, with business intelligence, you're going to be looking at the data which uh, the businesses are taking in, but you're going to have to extrapolate the important information from that, and then you'll be passing that on to um, like stakeholders or senior members of staff, which they can then implement that data uh, into business processes moving forward to kind of increase whether it's productivity or profit, but it'll be, you'll be working with that day which they will be using uh, to do these business decisions as well. Um, so we'll just move on to the software test analyst. So with this one, it's going to be looking more so whether it's applications or softwares which the business is using, and you're going to be testing that to make sure that it runs as best as possible. So it might be automated testing or it might be manual testing. We are going to be really 
proofing that software to make sure it works and make sure it's applicable, whether it's going to be internally to the business or whether it's going to be an application or software which is going to be let out to the masses. So you're kind of the last barrier before it gets released and you're going to be testing all those functions to make sure it works. So just moving on to uh, robotic process automation or RPA. So this is probably one of the newer uh, roles that we do have available. Uh, so usually when people look at uh, RPA or robotic process automation, they think a fine robot league or uh, like Terminator 2 or something like that. But actually it is, again, it's going to be software based. So this is going to be looking at business processes and um, looking at maybe like menial tasks, so repetitive tasks. Think of a production line with cars. It's very repeatable actions that you'd be doing there. But what we're going to be looking to do is turning those functions into software so that they can be then repeated um, thousands, hundreds of times faster than a human. So that can reduce human hours, but then also by you creating this software, which will be doing these business processes, it's actually moving the forward, moving forward the, the capacity which the business can uh, run at. Um, and we move on to the last technical role there. So this one's again is quite self-explanatory. It's a software developer. So in the software lifecycle, to start off with, you're going to have the software developers. So they're going to be creating the code. They're going to be creating the application there. So this is going to be very um, coding heavy. So whether it's like Java, C++, C Sharp, Python, there's loads of different languages that you can use with software developer. Uh, majority of the time that we'll be using will be Java or .NET. So that's a bit of thing about what the software developer will be covering in and how that kind of interacts with them there. So we're not, uh, we're not statically doing those roles. There's always new ones which are coming up, so we're trying to adapt to the market, especially after this year. And you can see how the digital skills gap and the digital gaps in businesses have really been uh, shone into light as well. So at the moment, cloud computing is something that we're going to start rolling out. So a lot of businesses have started moving to cloud, whether it's AWS, Azure, or even Google Cloud. This is something that's been massively implemented across all businesses in every sector. So this is going to be a massive role in the next few years to come. Um, similar solutions architect. So with this role, uh, it's going to be looking at new procedures which the business is Business are going to be implementing in a technical standpoint and you're going to be looking on how you can introduce these new technologies into the business and make sure that moves smoothly as well so whether it's working with legacy products or whether it's cutting edge um, cutting edge softwares or programs being introduced into the business with a solutions architect you're going to be overlooking that and seeing how that can then be implemented and move forward with the business finally enough we have the big data engineer so this is another thing which has become a massively important, which is very linked, uh, very closely linked to cloud computing. Um, as I'm sure you where data is starting to run the world at the moment because everyone is online and with everyone being online, that means there's huge, huge data sets which businesses are having to process. And these can't be done by conventional means, which has been historically done. They're having to create new methodology to actually go through these big data. And that's why this is another new role big data engineers is going to be implemented into loads of businesses and it's going to be one of the biggest uh, biggest roles which you're going to be looking for in the next few years to come so the, the last five i went through just go back to that slide there so these are the, these are the ones that we're doing mostly but then we also have these new ones as well which will be coming over this year and and forward thinking as well so they're the roles that we do and this is now the selection process so as I'm sure you can imagine, to get on board with our graduate program, firstly enough, you have to apply. So you can apply online uh, just through FDM, uh, so you can just search on Google and it'll, it'll go through all those, uh, uh, those individual pathways I just went through. So you can read a bit further, you can even look at testimonies and look at other success stories uh, from there. So once you have completed the application, that's when you move on to the second step. And this will be a telephone call, so this will be from your recruiter. So you'll be assigned a recruiter who will help you throughout all of this selection process. And at this point, it'll just be a 10, 15 minute call where it'll just go through confirming some of the details from the application. Uh, but also, they'll ask you a few questions to find out what your skill set is, your suitability for the program, and also cover what the remaining step stages are. So once you have been through that pre-screen phone call, uh, you'll move on to the next step which is a video interview. Um, so with us, it is, it's done remotely and it's all 
It's all uh, web-based and they are pre-recorded questions. Uh, but all these questions will be strength-based, so that definitely aligns with what I'm going to be covering later on in this uh, presentation. Once you have finished with the video interview, uh, you will get feedback from your individual recruiter, um, whether it's whether you pass or if you fail, they'll still get that feedback. And if not, you should always ask for feedback, whether it's with FDM or with any other recruiter as well. So whether you've passed or if you failed, always ask for that feedback. So once you've finished with the video interview um, and you've got your feedback and you've been successful, you move on to the online tests. So the online tests will be a, a series of aptitude and reasoning tests. So you've got the IT aptitude, you've got verbal reasoning, uh, numerical reasoning, and you've also got set notation and Venn diagram tests. So they're, they're a specific online test that we do there. But lots of different businesses will do a different range, but usually it will be aptitude or reasoning tests, which you'll come across there. And then if successful with the online tests, that's when you transition to the final stage, which is the final stage interviews, uh, which will be a similar structure to the video interviews where there'll be strength based questions, uh, but these will be live. So you'll be actively speaking with someone and doing that interview with someone uh, from our business. So it's usually a senior member of staff or it's one of our trainers. So they'll really be able to dig into your expertise there and really figure out which kind of area you'd be looking to go into, but also what your skill set align with as well. And then finally, if you are successful and you pass the final stage interviews, that's when you can move that you, that's when you'll be offered a place on our award winning graduate scheme. And then that's when you'll start the next stages, what you'll be doing your training and then going on to your placement. And that's the graduate program there as well. So that's the selection process in a nutshell. So these are the different stages which you'll be going through there, but you will be getting support at each step from your individual recruiter, but there's also other, other avenues uh, which we do have, which can give you support in these different areas. So, like I mentioned, um, with the video interview and the final stage interview, they're going to be strength based questions. So these are the individual strengths which are specific to FDM group. Um, so a lot of businesses either have certain cultures, certain strengths, certain notes which, which they are looking for for each person who comes through, whether it's a, a normal job or whether it's a graduate program. This information usually will be on the, re, the recruiting uh, the recruiting website. So when looking at these strengths, I don't want you to think about who will have that strength, who will have that strength, but I don't have that one. Um, all of these strengths you do have, and all of these strengths you would have shown at different points, especially at university there. Um, so let's just take, for example, driven performer. Um, a person in strong in driven performer are self-motivated and do whatever they need to get things done. So I can definitely think back to when I was at university. I didn't want to do my coursework, but you have to be driven and you have to be self-motivated to do um, to do any kind of coursework that you need to do there. So you would have shown that you've been a driven performer just by completing your work, just by attending university. But you just got to think of these individual points and just relate that to your experiences as well. Again, with relationship builder, uh, apart from learning at university, it's definitely a massive networking opportunity because people on your course may go on to do different roles, different positions, which could be helpful in the future, but also just uh, creating those lasting relationships, not even just in a professional capacity, but also in a personal capacity, uh, which can definitely help you moving forward. So still, again, think about the opportunities where you use these strengths. It's not on the case of whether you have them or you don't. You just got to think about those times when you've shown these strengths as well. Um, so I'll just go through one more. So I'll just go through resilient achiever. Um, so as you can see here, people strong and resilient achiever quickly recover from setbacks, remaining positive and focused on what they need to achieve. I think everybody's probably shown this strength this year. Uh, it's been a massive setback in, in one, one way or another. And the fact that you guys are still at university, that you're attending this today, is shown that you're being resilient and you're trying to achieve as best as possible. So again, don't think about these strengths in a personal way. Think about these strengths of when you've showcased them in the past and how then you can showcase them in the future. So that's just a bit about the individual strengths that we're looking for at FDM. But each, each business, each company will have their own, so always look out for these when applying for roles in the future. So yeah, so I've been speaking a lot about strength, but let's actually define what a strength is. So a strength is something that you do well and you enjoy doing. Using a strength 
Uh, when using the strength, people feel enthusi uh, enthusiastic, energized, authentic, as they deliver successful performances. Um, so as you can see from this chart here, if you do a performance and you succeed, you get your endorphins, you feel very positive, um, and you feel good, so that's where the energy comes. And then from doing that cycle, that positive feedback, you then start doing it again. You start repeating that process. And that's where something that you're skilled at becomes something that you're strong at. So that's that's how a strength is developed, and that's how it moves from a skill to become more of a strength and where you can use it um, as and when. So these are some examples of what we do with strength-based questions. So this is kind of the this is going to be the formula which you'll see on our side when you do the video interview and also when you do the, the, live, in, uh, the live interviews as well at the final stage. So you always start with a warm up question. So this is when you're telling about uh, an activity that you really enjoy. So this links to the last slide, which I said is we're trying to figure out what you enjoy, so what you're enthusiastic about. So we can then scale that and see how enthused you are uh, to the other questions that you answer. So there's going to be two main different types of strength-based questions that you come across. You'll have the, the forced response question, um, which is going to make you actively think. And then you have the difficult to prepare for scenarios, which will be very specific to the role that you're going to be um, applying for. So as you can see, the, the forced response question is, in your opinion, which is more important? Taking extra time to produce high quality work or completing work more quickly to a lower standard? So. When answering strength-based questions, um, like I mentioned earlier with those strengths, uh, the seven strengths that went through, you want to use those little bits of experience to then put it into your answer, to really develop your answer there. So with the false response question, as you can see, it doesn't really prompt you to use an example. It's just asking you the question one or the other. So it's very hard for you to then implement your example when going through that. As for the difficult to prepare, uh, scenario and um, I'll just read through it very quickly. Imagine you've created a set of recommendations for your client. You discover that you cannot work due to a number of factors you are not aware of. What would be your immediate reaction? How would you move forward? So that's already prompting uh, some more of a structured answer to say how you would do this but then also you're gonna have to incorporate that example uh, from your past experience to then show how you can then develop that and move that and show those strengths moving forward. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have two example videos. Um, the first video is going to be linked to the false response question. And then the second video is going to be linked to the difficult to prepare for scenario question. So just before we go into those, um, if you can just write down in the chat box, just a quick list of things which you think would be good uh, to prepare for video interviews, and then also ones for things that you should avoid when doing video interviews. So I'll just give you a couple minutes just for you to just chat, the, uh, just to jot down in the chat box, uh, just what you think would be good for video interviews and what you think you shouldn't do when, when doing a video interview there. Getting many responses. I can't. So we've got a good quiet place. Yeah. Absolutely. And bad being underprepared. Definitely. I'm nodding. You can't see me because I've turned my camera off. I'm sat here nodding. <laughs> <laughs> I do it all the time. I'll mute myself and start talking away. I've <laughs> uh, got good. Um, read anything sent out by the interviewer. Definitely. Yeah. 
Just to add on to that, definitely at FDM, we're looking to get as many people successful through the program as possible. Um, so always listen to your recruiter because we want you to be as successful as you want to be. So always every kind of tip that we give is always to increase your success rate there. And I've got bad, poor light, broken camera, bad Wi-Fi. Yeah, especially with that last point, always ensure you have a good internet connection, <laughs> especially with the live interviews. Because even if you do answer them really well, it can be very off-putting if you have a poor internet connection and you, you're dropping lines or the, you're missing important information when answering there. So it can definitely be detrimental against you there. Um, I've got another one to present. Um, present yourself formally, um, a quiet background, answer confidently. Um, so whatever I know and understand, express myself clearly. Yep. Uh, it is OK to ask to repeat question if I don't understand. Yeah, again, that last point is is a very good point to make. Um, if you don't hear them clearly, don't gamble. Um, it's best to just ask them again to repeat the question. Even if you need a, a few extra seconds to think, that's always a good little trick to do is just say, oh, can you just repeat the question? And then you can have a, another quick think about how to answer it as well. Perfect. So yeah, I'll just move on to the next slide there. Um, so yeah, this is a little little task here. So we're going to do the first video interview there. So just have a look at the body language, look at the tone of voice. So eye contact is a very important one as well. So especially with virtual interviews, um, that engagement is going to be noticed a lot more than whether it would be in person, uh, person to person, than it would be virtual. Yeah, how far does the candidate answer the question? How far does the candidate answer the question and is an example given? So like I mentioned earlier, examples are the most important thing. So that's how you, you validate your strength. That's how you show that you can show that, that strength that they're looking for and how then you can showcase it in the future. OK. So again, I'm going to play the video once it's played just in the chat box. Just make note of, of good things or bad things which happened in this interview here as well. And also, if the if the volume doesn't work properly, just let me know. I haven't got any sound coming out, Sheldon. Okay. Just one moment there. Gonna try and pop it back up again. But I've got a thing. Can you hear that now? So uh, I think taking extra time to to produce high quality work can be good. Um, um, but uh, but I think in a lot of situations it's quite quiet. But yes. Even the time frames is not always been forced on. So actually getting the work done quickly, uh, making sure that your your manager's actually got something to work on. Um, yeah. So yeah, so that, that was the first video interview. Maybe the volume might have been a point to make as well. Um, so yeah, so if you want to just jot down into the comments just to say what feedback you'd give to this candidate here just from their video interview. Are we getting much feedback? Would, would anyone yeah, pass it? So I've got I did not understand that this was an interview. It looks like he was just reading a text from her, the diary. Um, eye contact. So we've had a, we've had examples eye contact. There wasn't any. Yeah, exactly. Even though it was a bit quiet, so it might be due to his mic, but there was actually music playing in the background, which is like another thing, which like we mentioned earlier, you want to be in a quiet zone. You want to ensure that they can hear you. Um, eye contact. Yeah, because he wasn't very engaged. He was looks as if he was reading from notes. It's not sending good vibes, whether you could hear what you're saying or not, just from the body language, you're like, mm, 
do they look confident enough to be moving forward with that as well? Um, and any other feedback that we're getting from everyone? So I've also got, um, he was moving like he was alone in leisure. <laughs> So he was, yeah, he was, wasn't he? He was very much leaning back and like squirming around. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a dance. <laughs> <laughs> They're the good answers, thank you. Perfect. Um, so yeah, so now we're just going to have a look at another example of a video interview. So like I mentioned, this is going to be looking at the second question. So imagine you've created a set of recommendations for your client. Uh, you discover that they cannot work due to the number of factors you are not aware of. What would your immediate reaction? Uh, what would be your immediate reaction? And how would you move forward? So again, as as well as giving some feedback, just say whether you'd pass or fail this person as well. I would at first feel quite frustrated in this scenario due to the time and effort I had put into my recommendations so far. However, it's important to remain positive in a situation like this, so I would take a step back and refocus myself. I would analyse the new changes in line with my current recommendations to see why they couldn't work. I would look to see if my recommendations could be adapted or if they needed completely re-reviewing. I would also seek advice from those around me who may have been in a situation like this before and I would work additional hours if the recommendations were needed by a required deadline to make sure my client had a full set of appropriate recommendations. For example, at university, I was part of a group project whereby I was working on a project with my team and my client wanted some recommendations for that project. Halfway through, my clients changed um, some of the scenario to the project we were working on, which meant that our recommendations were no longer valid. As team lead, I said to the meeting, and my team did feel quite disheartened. I instilled positivity within the team and encouraged them and reminded them of the shared goal. This positivity was infectious, as myself and my team were able to collaborate and brainstorm some great ideas. And this led to the efficient delivery of a new set of recommendations to our clients. The client was impressed with our new recommendations and I achieved a first class for this particular module. Overall, in this scenario, it's important to remain positive in light of setbacks and refocus yourself, and also to collaborate with those around you to help gain some helpful um, advice, and also to make use of the information at hand. Perfect. So that was uh, Christy. So yeah. Would you guys pass or fail this video interview? And also some feedback points from which you notice from that as well. So how's it looking so far? Uh, that was really, that was very nice and definitely right answers. Um, a good clear voice, examples easy to understand and confident. Yeah, like I say, she is a well developed answer. Um, like I mentioned, you want to start off with strength based questioning, saying how you would tackle the situation in front of you, but then also she reinforced the answer with an example from a university where they had a similar issue where uh, the client changed the parameters mid midway through. Um, so it's showing that she has come across something similar before and she can then showcase that moving forward. So that's that's the main reason why, especially with strength based questions, is to use those examples. So here's just some more tips as well, preparing for a video on virtual interviews. Um, so you've got to understand the role you've applied for thoroughly. So always research uh, the company, uh, see what their values are, see what strengths they're looking for. As you can see, the culture, and these things will definitely help you develop your own answer and make it make sure that you align with what they're looking for. So always research the company. If if you can't find anything online, speak to your recruiter, see if they can send you any additional content which you can have a look into or anything else which you can help prepare for these stages as well. Um, I think this was a point that was was raised earlier about considering your environment, make sure it's a quiet place. You don't want to clutter around, you want to be calm, you don't want to hear anyone else chatting behind you 
or in the area um, and usually have quite a neutral background just so it's not distracting the interviewer from just watching your video. So I'll just click on this here um, and this is a little video that we've actually made internally at FDM. So just let me know if it's actually showing up for you. Has this opened the browser up? No. No. Hi, I'm Greg, and I'm here to give you some tips and help you stand out in your web video meetings. One of the first tips I would like to be consider your location. Right now, I'm in the middle of the living room, and I don't have too many distractions in the background because I want to be at the forefront of the image. You can also consider a plain background where you can have a solid colored wall. It can be either gray, white, or any color that's within your household. Just make sure that you're not wearing something that is the same color as the background wall so that you stand out and you are eliminated and at the forefront of your video conference. Tip number two, camera placement. Whether you have an integrated web camera built into the laptop screen or whether or not you have a plugged in external web camera, what you want to try and aim for is making sure that the web camera is at eye level. It makes such a big difference when you're talking to someone straight across the table, rather than having to look up or down at someone because the camera is either placed too high or too low. So try and keep a neutral playing field whenever you're placing the camera within your setup. Tip number three, window lighting. Whether you're in a large room with many windows or whether or not you're in a small room with one window, Neutralizing the amount of light coming through the window has many benefits. So I would suggest you close the curtains or pull down the blinds. So by reducing the amount of light coming in means that you have more control over the image and it'll neutralize any harsh shadows that might be either across your face or the background, which can also be distracting for the viewer. There, that looks a lot better. Now that we've pulled down all the blinds within the room, there's no harsh shadows which will be creating a lot of contrast for the web camera to be kind of trying to fight whether or not it illuminates you or the background. So everything's on a neutral playing field, which brings me on to the next tip, which is key lighting. Key lighting is going to take your web camera to the next level. Now that we've diffused all of the harsh light coming in through the windows, I have no harsh shadows on my face. There's no harsh shadows in the background. I want to make sure that we're creating a key light source Key light can be found anywhere within the household. For example, I use this simplified desk lamp. I can plug this in and what it will do is it will separate me from the neutrally lit background and it'll put me at the forefront of the image. As you can see, we've now turned on the key light and what this does is it illuminates the subject at the foreground of the image and separates them from the background. That's what you want when you're doing your web conferencing. The last tip that I want to give you for today is to try your best in looking straight down the lens when you're on a web call. It's dead easy to look at yourself. I make the same mistake too, but looking straight down the lens makes the other person feel as though that you're connecting and talking straight to them. That's all I have for you today. Stay well and stay safe, and I'll see you next time. So yeah, so that was just a few more tips there, as you can see very helpful if you are looking to do a uh, any kind of calls that you're going to be doing or any kind of interviews and um, just follow those tips like you say you can't fill all of them but if you can either control the lighting or you can control the level of the camera just those little tips will just make it look a bit more engaging a bit more helpful when actually going through to the interviews themselves so these are just a bit a few more tips when preparing for strength-based interviews virtual or whether it's in person um, online examples usually tend to focus on well-known warm-up questions, so always research your company strengths for insight. 
um, just so you're not looking at generic questions yet, you can actually look at questions which are going to be formulated towards that company that you're going to be going for. Um, always be authentic, uh, always try and be yourself. It can definitely come across a lot easier when you can see like from the first interview, you can see he was reading notes, you couldn't really engage with him, you couldn't really gauge what kind of person he was. So just trying to be authentic, just use footnotes if you do need to use notes, maybe bullet points. Another trick which I try and do as well is if you are going to be using a camera, maybe use like post-it notes, just put them below the camera, just so it looks as if you are looking at the camera, but always still getting those little, those little nudges to answer the best, best way you can. So the next point is probably one of the most important things with strength-based questioning is to take control. So I don't know if you can think back to those two example questions that we went through. Those, those questions would be the only thing you'd be asked. They can't be probing, they can't say, oh, do you have an example of when you've showcased this, or can you go in a bit more? They can't do those probing questions with strength-based interviews. So always think as if you're speaking to someone who has no prior information about yourself. So you need to put forward all the skills, all the strengths that you've got within your answering, just to make sure that they know what kind of person you are and how then you can be useful for the business moving forward. Uh, next point is think before speaking. So I did touch on this earlier as well, whether it's asking them to repeat the question just to get a little bit more of time um, or even just say to the interviewer, just say, oh, do you mind if I just have 10 seconds just to think about the answer before I start? More times than not, the interviewer would rather you have a well-developed answer than something that you're just going to rush and then just say whatever comes straight to your mind there. So always think about your answer before you, before you actually do your answer there as well. So um, from what I've been explaining with strength-based questions, you're probably going to think, oh, I've come across something similar with the STAR framework. Um, so that's useful, but that's usually we have competency-based questions, which are slightly different to strength-based questions. Uh, so you want to use examples as a backup as a strength rather than using it as part of the framework itself. So you still want to say how you're going to tackle that situation, but you, you need to use that example to reinforce your answer there. So they're just extra tips just to help you prepare for a strength-based interview. So, like I mentioned earlier, there's going to support for you throughout the entire process. So, your first point of contact is your recruiter. So, they're the person who are going to try and ensure that you are successful at each point. Use them as much as you can. Uh, bug them, send them emails, call them. If you need that support, they'll be there to help you as well. And that's not just with any kind of steps, but it's also if you need reasonable adjustments, whether you need extra time, whether you don't even have the equipment or you'd say your, your, your camera's broken on your laptop. We can then do it on a telephone interview instead. So there's always ways and means for us to make this adjustable to yourself as well. This is another critical point. So again, this is regardless whether you're successful or whether you're not successful getting through the interview stage. Always reflect um, whether you get the feedback from your recruiter or whether you want to just give yourself feedback there. So these are some points which you should always think about. Were you properly prepared? Were there any questions that you did well, but also ones that you struggled with? Do you feel as if you did yourself justice? Did, you, did it showcase any gaps um, or experiences which you may not have thought you had, but which would be necessary moving forward? Um, and how could you have done things differently? So these are all really massively important things which you should always look into uh, when, when seeking employment. Always reflect on each point, see where you could have improved, see where, um, see where you did well also. So just going through to the final stage interview format. So this is at the end of the process. So this is the last thing you need to do before you are offered a place on our graduate program. So this, these three steps will all happen within the morning. So it starts off with a business introduction. So they'll go through uh, a bit more detail group, a bit more detail about the graduate program. Uh, usually lasts about an hour or so. So it will be with a senior member of staff who will be Holding that, uh, holding that event there. Um, thereafter, you'll be put into waiting rooms. So all this will be held on Zoom. Um, so I don't know if any of you guys have used Zoom yet. I know it's been massively used in different educational institutions. Um, so you'll be in a breakout room and then from that point, you'll 
be broken off into um, individual rooms with the interview, whether it be free shot interviews, questions ranging from about four to six of them, uh, including that warm up question, like I mentioned, but then the rest of them will all be strength based interviews. So always bear that in mind. If you're strength based, use an example. So yeah, so that's that's the end of the that's the uh, end of the event today. Uh, hopefully, it has been a lot of helpful information to help you guys prepare as best as possible for virtual or video interviews. And um, more in the floor for any questions that you have. Also, as well, there be any feedback that you'd like to give. Um, I do believe you said you guys will be sending one out, so that's perfectly fine. Um, if you would like to connect with me on LinkedIn, um, there's my funky little picture there on the left. Um, and it's a QR code on the right. So if you just use your phone, uh, you can just scan that and that should take you straight away to my LinkedIn page there as well. So I'll just leave that up for a couple minutes. Um, but yeah, do, do you have any questions coming through so far? Bear with me. Right, so yeah. we've got, is FDM recruiting this year or for 2021? Um, you recruit on, a, on an ongoing basis, don't you? You don't have a, a, an end date. Yeah, that's right. So we actually recruit all year round. Um, for 2021 graduates, we actually do have a specific page where you can do it there to register your interest because we aren't processing those applications at the moment. Um, if you just give me a second. What about 2020 graduates? Because Benjamin's a 2020 graduate. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so 2020 graduates, um, we are doing that at the moment. So what I'll do is just pop that up. I'll just write in my email address if you want to contact me. Um, and then we can help you through the, the graduate process there. And... Oh, 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 hold on. Okay. Um, oh, so you've got your email address on there. And also, when um, are you going to be offering placement year next year? Um, yes. So our placement students this year have actually started two or three weeks ago. Um, so we haven't opened it up for next year as of yet. But I do believe it will be in the next coming months. Okay. So recommend is either uh, Follow us on LinkedIn and they'll, they'll give all the updates there for placements or on our website. You also have um, alert notifications for that as well. OK, um, brilliant. If I'm. If I'm able to get. Um, notification of that, that would be 